sape nyanyi di Indonesia.
friends, we know what we should be doing in every European country. What we should be doing in every European country. and initiatives have to be connected. We need not only state, even more, we need transnational, global, large-scale actions. We also soon realize that we are in fact part of the huge tide of hope. The tide of hope we see in the M25, in Barcelona en Comú, in Zagreb Janás, and the, all the other movements that inspire us. Now we are sure that our problem recognizes no borders, as we are sure that our strength lies in solidarity. And our message is that we cannot give up. And we will continue the struggle to reclaim our cities across our countries and across our Europe. And we will win. Thank you. When you want to build something, you are it's like you must you must have to do wrong choice. And yes, maybe I hope that now Europe will do good choice. Let's shake Europe. Gently, compassionately, but firmly. Welcome, everybody. 
on this very, very special evening. Um, and it's special because you came all the way here through the rain, the Irish rain. I'm really happy about that. Um, I'm going to keep it very short. Um, today today uh, will consist of two parts. First of all, we're going to present to you what we actually did during the day, um, because we didn't start just now. Uh, the day has been really a new experiment in participatory politics, so to say. So we had people over from all across the country, even people from outside of Ireland, and we have been discussing uh, the big, big topic of the democratic European constitution today in a World Cafe setting. And Pedro will explain to you what we did during the day. Um, break um, so you can actually get to know each other. Uh, these kind of events are not just there for you to sit down and listen but also for you there to participate, to get to know each other, to build networks across movements, um, across countries, across, across cultures. And um, then in the second half um, we will discuss the European New Deal that is being proposed by DiEM25 and what it can do for Ireland and for Europe. Um, but before I give the word to uh, Yanis Varoufakis, who is here for us tonight, I just want to thank already the great team we had to put this all together. We put works of week in this. Um, so I would really, really like to thank Pedro, uh, Kim, Alfonso, Ezekiel, uh, Ola, uh, Killian, all the people that make this evening possible and happening. So. A really great applause, uh, applause for those people. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I won't spill any more words on you tonight, uh, and I will call to the stage uh, Yanis Varoufakis. Good evening, Dublin. Good evening, everyone. Um, let me begin with greetings that I'm bringing to you. From Berlin, I came from Berlin, uh, from a, a theater like this, because when they turn our parliaments into farce, we take theaters and we turn them into parliaments across Europe. Uh, two months ago, we were in Rome. It was the 60th anniversary of the European Union, of the European Economic Community, the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome. And all the great and the good were there, our leaders, Celebrating, I have no idea what exactly they were celebrating. What was it? Brexit, the disintegration of the European Union, the loss of our soul and our integrity as Europeans. They were celebrating something. We had also um, taken up another theater, the Teatro Itali Italia, and um, uh, you saw some glimpses of what we were doing there. But the essence of what we were doing was instead of sipping champagne and eating cannabis like Merkel and uh, Kenny and various others were doing, we were actually doing work. We were discussing the European New Deal, which is what we've been working on for more than a year as the 25 to answer the pertinent question that nobody has really answered or even posed. Not the European Commission, not the European Council, not even the European Parliament for that matter. How do we uh, respond by means of pragmatic, but effective policies to the economic crisis, which is um, unleashing centrifugal forces tearing Europe apart and giving rise to Brexit and giving rise to the uh, phenomena like Marine, Marine Le Pen. Now, we all breathe the sigh of relief when Le Pen was defeated, but there's nothing to celebrate. 11 million French men and women voted for a neo-fascist, xenophobic, racist party. You only have to state this to start feeling the shivers all over, not just your spine, everywhere. Um, now, today, we're going to be talking, from what I gather, from what the, uh, uh, the good people of DiEM25 Dublin have organized and have conveyed to me, or to us, we're going to be talking about two things. Part A, the European Union Constitution, which we don't have, <laughs> and whether we should have it and what it should, like, should look like and how do we put it together. And the second question, uh, the European New Deal, which is, uh, as I said before, the policy framework, uh, 
economic and social policy framework that uh, we're putting forward as an alternative to TINA, to the toxic dogma that there is no alternative. We are going to, uh, we want to get rid of TINA and we want to replace TINA with Tatiana. That astonishingly, there is an alternative. Now, these good comrades and friends uh, are going to convey to you the results of the deliberations from this morning, this afternoon, on the European Union constitution process. But allow me to say a few words uh, to motivate the discussion. Oh, I might as well sit down as well. I'm getting old. Right. Um, why do we need the constitution? Well, the question is do we need a united Europe? Because if we need a European Union, uh, then we better have a democratic European Union. And there can be no democratic European Union unless the rules of the game are uh, written down in the form of a short document that we can all be proud of and which can guide our aspirations and our behavior and our governance. We don't have that. And have you ever tried to read the Lisbon Treaty? Don't. Not a good idea. It's really. Firstly, you won't make it. <laughs> Secondly, it's really bad for the soul. Um, what, more than 10 years ago, there was an attempt to create the European Union constitution. The result was that it failed the test in uh, various countries. You know very well the story. Why did it fail? Is it because Europeans do not want the European constitution? No. It failed because it was done top down. F um, a former pre president of the French Republic was asked to put together uh, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, very nice man, thoroughly nice man. Uh, he had a very large uh, committee that was convened to help him through lots of bickering and uh, um, debating amongst themselves, write it together. But when it's top down, uh, the result is inevitable. It's a despicable document. The particular document began with the rights of capital. Even the American Constitution begins with the rights of people. It says man, but you know, sex is men and women. Yeah? The European Union Constitution began, began with the rights of capital, of money, not of people. There were no rights of people in there. It was the rights of business. So, of course, it was rejected at the ballot box, thankfully. So, we need to discuss uh, the, the ways in, in, well, actually, allow me to go a, bit, a step backwards. Uh, up until almost a year ago, when I was um, traveling around Europe, presenting DiEM's ideas about economic policies that would save the Eurozone, let's say, that would save Europe, that would stop the fragmentation, that will bring us closer together instead of driving us further apart. The criticism that uh, our proposals faced was useful. It was along the lines of, oh, okay, you're saying that if we do A, B, C, D, uh, the European Union project is going to be strengthened, the Eurozone is going to be rendered viable, but we don't believe that you're right because of various reasons. That was an interesting conversation and a heartwarming conversation. For a year now, and a little bit more than a year, whenever I travel in France, in Portugal, in Poland, in Germany, of course in Greece, um, in Spain, a different criticism emerges. Why do we want to save Europe? Let it, let it disintegrate. It was a bad idea. It's a and it doesn't work. The Brexit attitudes, which has um, su succeeded in Britain, but it is ever-present everywhere in Europe. In Italy today, have you noticed that? They, well, they haven't had a government now for a long time, but um, if you look at the political parties contesting the next election, we don't even know when it's going to be, but it will be within the next... Within the next um, 10 months or so. Only one contestant, Matteo Renzi, is in favor of the European Union, actually of the Eurozone, of Italy's 
continued presence in the Eurozone. Everybody else is either inimical to the Euro or campaigning for it to get out. Now, let's not talk about the merits of those propositions, but what is interesting is that Brexit is everywhere. I'm coming, as I said, from Berlin. This is something I can't prove <laughs> mathematically or statistically, but I can, I can, I can relate to you as a sensation I have in, in Germany. Germany is where Britain was 10 years ago. For the first time in Germany, there is a concerted animosity towards the Eurozone that is rising from two different parts of the socioeconomic spectrum, from the rich, the financiers, the elites from above and from below, from the working class. This is exactly what was happening in Britain 10 years ago with Brexit, how it began. And if we continue the forces of economic deflation and political disintegration to, 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 to progress, there will be, well, the European Union is going to re resemble the Commonwealth of Independent States. Do you remember when the Soviet Union collapsed and gave rise to the Commonwealth of Independent States? When I was in Moscow some time ago, I, I saw there was a building that had a, a plaque in the Commonwealth of Independent States. And there's still an office, still functions. Nobody knows about it because it's irrelevant. I very much fear the European Union may, may be moving <laughs> in that direction. I hope not. But if, we, if progressives do not confront this sterile confrontation between the deep establishment whose authoritarian incompetence is giving rise to the crisis and the disintegrationists, what we call it, the, the, the nationalist international, who actively seek to um, disintegrate the European Union, we are not going to, um, to end up with positive developments. We are prob most probably going to have a post-modern 1930s. Because that's what the disintegration of the European Union is going to bring about. And the greatest, in the end, motive power behind disintegration is the so called liberal establishment, which uh, is running the show and which is very Europeanist in name, like the Weimar Republic, which was very much in favor of the Weimar Republic, but the Weimar Republic was the, its own worst enemy in the 1920s and early 1930s. Now, allowed to conclude by confronting head-on a fallacy. Everywhere in Europe and outside of Europe, critics of the idea of a European Union, a proper European Union, uh, what, what they keep doing is they keep repeating the, the statement, which has some logic to it, that, well, there's no such thing as a European demos, there is no such thing as a European people. Therefore, unlike in the United States, for instance, or in Australia, where there was a federation, or in Germany, where there was a unification in the 19th century and the federation after the Second World War, we are lacking the culture, the common culture, the common language, the common uh, spirit of a nation which is necessary in order to found a federation. And my response to this is that, well, you have. It helps if everybody, all of us, go and spend some years living in Texas. Because I did that. I spent some year, a few years of my life with my wife in Texas. And it was a very instructive experience. Uh, meeting Norwegians, Irish, Brits, Germans, Portuguese in Texas, suddenly we realized we come from the same village. We have the same culture. We are the same people. So I think that we should all move to Texas for a couple of years and to change our mind about this and to realize that uh, there is a European demos. Of course, any demos, any identity is constructed. It is not part of our DNA. You are not Irish because of your DNA and I'm not Greek because of my DNA. Uh, we are who we are on the basis of two things, culture and political action or action of all sorts. Go back to the inception of the United States of America. Do you know that, do you remember the historical fact that when the United States was being put together, 65% um, of uh, its citizens or subjects or whatever back then 
um, didn't speak English. They came from different parts of the world, uh, different communities. They were not assimilated into anything resembling a, a common nation. The one thing that brought them together was the act of drafting a 20-page document by which they swore and by which they lived the European, the European, the United States Constitution. Now, of course, to do this, you need to have what we leftists used to refer to as the objective conditions of history moving in that direction. The economic and social forces that make a political act of coming together and forging a common identity possible. Well, this is why the second part of today, the European Union deal, is essential. Because it is our uh, proposal of our um, policy agenda for creating change in the dynamics of our economies and our societies to bring about the circumstances so that we can sit down and discuss the process of democratic grassroots process by which Local assemblies would lead to regional assemblies, which will lead to national assemblies, will lead, will lead eventually to a pan-European constitutional assembly, out of which a 20-page document worth fighting for will emerge. Thank you. Okay, so... The need for a constitution within the M25 European constitution is quite clear. This major agreement among the M25 uh, members, let's say, is one of the objectives of our manifesto. However, um, what we've been doing today is we have invited people from Ireland to join the conversation. There are hundreds, probably thousands of ways in which you can draft and uh, harvest collective knowledge to produce decisions. And we are only 500 million Europeans, so in order to get those 20 pages that Janice was talking about, we have to do some work. So the strategy that we have to use today is called the um, World Cafe. It is quite simple. You have a set of questions, and um, uh, basically you have a number of topics, and for each topic, you have a set of questions. And people are sitting comfortably in chairs and tables, drinking coffee and tea, and just having a good time. It's not horrible. And then in each table, one question is addressed during three rounds, basically. Three questions per topic. And um, then you, work, you change the round. And at the end of each topic, we try to emerge with uh, a general conclusion of what has been said in the room in the different 20 tables or whatever. So each one of our my, of, of my colleagues uh, is going to put forward to you these conclusions. And uh, basically we work on three topics. The first one was the constitutional issue itself. Do you? Do the people who came along think that Europe needs a constitution? If so, why? And um, why European? So what makes us European and why does, uh, is it necessary to join our efforts in finding the rules of the game that we need to play this big, big, big game, which is democracy, right? And we need a lot of people involved and, uh, okay, so that's how we started, 50 people. Our hope is that um, this sort of exercise will be repeated over and over in Europe by the M25 and other people. We don't have to be naive. A constitutional movement has to be a widespread movement that has to go further and beyond the M25, which doesn't mean that the M25 is not going to play a radical and mm, essential role because we are a pan-European uh, movement and we are located all over Europe and that is going to make things flow and uh, go faster, right? So without uh, more to say for the minute, I'll introduce then um, Anthony, 
who will be talking about the constitutional issue, uh, David, who will be talking about the fundamental values that should be, according to the people who was in the room, to were in the room, um, which fundamental values should be in this constitution. Those, of course, will have to be discussed with people from Helsinki and from uh, Athens, of course, but that's, that's to come in the future. First, we have to know what we think. And then finally, um, Phil is going to um, talk about how we think this constitutional movement could be exported and uh, just get the snowball rolling. This is snowball, it's very clear. When people have hope, they will take part, and then the snowball will grow, and that's our hope, and that's our strategy. So the final topic that we were discussing is how do we go about this? How, we do, how do we build a constitutional, European constitutional movement? So, Marcel, please uh, answer. Uh, thank you very much, Pedro. Um, I'd like to start in August 1789, just a few months after the Terrorist State founded the National Assembly in France as part of the revolution there. The Declaration of the Right of Man and the Citizen was drafted, um, and together with such documents like the Magna Carta, the US Bill of Rights, things like that, it's seen as one of the precursors uh, to, one to, the, to the majority of today's constitutions. And it covers a wide range of rights, but one of the most crucial ones um, is Article 3. The principle of any sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. No body, no individual can exert authority which does not emanate expressly from it. Uh, this was mainly referring to King, um, King Louis XVI, because at the time the French monarchy was seen as a force of oppression and an undue beneficiary of the French state at the cost of the citizen, much like the majority of European states at the time of the monarchies. Um, 228 years later, in 2017, and only six EU countries have monarchies, and none of them are seen as a genuine force of oppression. But we do have a new threat to our sovereignty, um, a new body in contravention of Article 3 that is exerting authority, which does not emanate expressly from the nation, and that's the corporation. You don't have to look far um, to see the unfettered control corporations have uh, over our lives and our sovereignty. I mean, the grass that Shell has on its oil, on oil in Ireland, the cowardice of our own government here in Ireland in the face of Apple's greed, uh, the deceit of BBVA in Spain, and you know, of course, the closed doors of CETA and TTIP in Brussels and Strasbourg. Uh, so it's no surprise then that this was our biggest concern. That was outlined this, outlined this morning in the cafe. Um, that is to say, corporate and financial power. Now alone, that's not a terribly large threat, but combined um, with further concerns that were raised this morning, for example, a uh, lack of transparency, a lack of uh, civic engagement, economic and social divides, and the disconnect between the Brussels bubble and the European people, which resulted in things like um, the European Constitution of 2004 and the Euro. You can see how events uh, like the ones I listed can and do and still unfortunately happen. This overarching problem feeds directly into the remaining uh, concerns we raised this morning. The environmental crisis, media ownership, parochial thinking, a lack of openness, and selfishness in general. Um, so big is this problem and its subsidiary problems that, aside from institutions like the EU and our linked economies, our concerns in this problem were identified this morning as the number one issue that unites us across Europe and as Europeans. Uh, other potential unifiers included our shared struggle for democracy from France in 1789 to the former Eastern Europe two decades ago, um, our common humanity as people and our need for peace, something sought from the Rome conquests uh, to the invasion of Crimea. Um, but overall, what was, this was seen as uniting us. Despite our myriad of problems and the fact that they are what unites us most, there is hope, which is good. Um, it was outlined this morning that a tremendous unifier is our future together. Um, we may not have a completely shared past, but the future is ours, and we can make it ours, we can make it European. Our problems might be manifold, but we do have a common vision for solving them together, and that vision here in DM is the Constitution. And while there are many disagreements throughout the cafe this morning, one unanimous agreement that we had was the need for the Constitution. Uh, the several reasons we gave for this, and the first one, was to outline and represent our values, our visions, and our rights as citizens. 
not, as co not corporate rights as outlined in the Lisbon Treaty. These are a vital part of any document looking to represent any organisation, and they must, core to this, must be a modern version of Article 3 of the Declaration of Rights of Man and Ex Citizen. That is, corporations have no right in controlling our lives and our sovereignty. Another unanimous decision this morning was that the Constitution must be a living document and open to change as required in the future. Um, so, to sum up, what did we learn this morning? We learned that a common European identity exists mainly as a result of our collective challenges faced across the continent. These challenges range from disconnect to Brussels, the environment, but there's one crucial topic underpinning that, and that is um, state and corporate collusion. And this needs to be addressed, and needs to be addressed now. But it's this challenge that unites us in hope, and that hope is reflected in our wish for a new constitution. And it shows that to be truly united in diversity, we must now unite in adversity. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Um, so following from that, that conversation, we went on to discuss um, what values should underpin this constitution, and what values do we share as DN25 members and also Europeans? And how can you, uh, you know, I mean, through the very demos that is um, the European people, how can you pick values that, beyond politics, re represent the kind of fundamental needs and wants and wishes of the people that it's supposed to protect? So the first thing we discussed is um, solidarity. Um, the word common kept coming up, like the c common values we share, the common good. Um, you, you know, how can European people work to, you know, to aid each other across borders, um, to pick things that can protect, the, you know, that protect, uh, to protect all and do, does not exclude anything. Uh, following from that, I suppose, we discussed um, the concept of nationalism, um, which is obviously one of the conversations that's going on in Europe at the moment. And what is it? And um, this, was a this was a complex question, especially in, uh, maybe perhaps unsurprisingly, in the Irish context. Um, we found it quite hard to define, and maybe that's a good thing. Um, we started by saying, you know, nationalism can be um, uh, a, a negative uh, political ontology, politics of blame, instead of it blames people, and um, it like points out certain groups, put certain groups against others, and instead of blaming the systems that are causing the problems. I was then pointed out that this might be a bit, um, overly restrictive, and that there, if you take the, the history of Northern Ireland, Ireland as an example, um, that there can, be a, there can be positive nationalism and negative nationalism. But ultimately, um, I think it was Phil actually um, brought us this back. This is actually a, a, a question really of solidarity amongst people as well. Um, if people are willing um, beyond to, to see fundamental human rights beyond their own their own immediate needs, like economic needs or social needs, and to recognise that other people are intrinsically as valuable and the rights of other people are intrinsically as valuable as the rights that they have themselves, then that transcends national, the national question. There's no need for nationalism in that. It's like, you know, an Irish, an, an Irish person's need is the same as a, an, a Muslim's need, is the same as any oppressed group in the face of an oppressor. Um, and finally, we discussed um, democracy. What does democracy mean to us as the M25 members? And surely, I'm sure anyone that was at the World Cafe event this morning will agree that this is it. People sitting in a room, coming to, anyone can come invited, sit in a room, discuss, build the idea of a constitution. And we today, 20 people sitting in a room in Dublin, can't speak for people in southern Greece, or people in northern Germany, or people in any part of the of the EU as a totality. But these kind of events repeated all over and information collected like we did today and fed back to a coordinating committee and discussed and through that a, a living uh, document that is a constitution to be generated, that's a democratic procedure and that's the kind of thing that the M25 stand for. So yeah, thank you. Okay, so lastly, um, how do we build this movement? So what brought us all here together uh, tonight, today, to, to talk about these issues? And um, what is those shared values that we can build a, a movement together that can change Europe and the destiny of Europe? Well, for decades, the centrist neoliberal establishment has been sleepwalking towards this crisis. And now today, even more frighteningly, we're being positively goose-step towards the abyss by the populist right. So we need to take action, and we need to see that our shared future 
needs to be part of a pan-European movement standing together. Uh, when calls of restricting democracy, as we've seen, or as Jan Svarek in fact said, of, of retreating to national boundaries, appears our response should be collective and it should be that we want more democracy and we want more internationalism because freedom and democracy must be universal if they're to be true to themselves. So this movement we felt um, strongly should be democratic at its core, that should be its very DNA. If we, if we identify the issue, the, the, the crisis at the heart of Europe is a lack of democracy, a lack of transparency, a lack of openness, then the movement that challenges that must have those key ingredients at its, its very formation. We must be an open, democratic, transparent organisation, led by the grassroots, uh, open and inclusive, where solutions are found through, through dialogue and, and building consensus and that our politics will not be combative. And we strongly felt that this movement must be as broad because the problems facing Europe are monumental and therefore we don't want a narrow movement. We want an inclusive movement that seeks real solutions because everywhere we are told uh, by the political establishment that there is no alternative, there is no other show in time, that there is only one reality and we should reject that reality strongly, together, loudly. Uh, and that's done by working together at a small local level and building the solutions upwards that can then frame this, the, the, the narrative that, that writes this constitution. So that's, that was the findings of, of the movement. So I would urge anyone here tonight who hasn't joined the M25 to, to please join us and, and add your voice to the many voices calling for change in Europe. Okay, so just um, I want to wrap up on this exercise before Jan takes the word, uh, before we move on to the um, break. And uh, this is my personal thing. I take the opportunity that I'm on stage. And um, okay, if you go back to the Indignados movement in um, Spain, back then I started thinking and writing how these people sitting on the streets um, can actually get organized to produce common will decisions. That is very difficult. It's very difficult. You all try to agree, at the end it's going to be a voting, and people are going to be, who, who voted, why, why were we voting this? Now there's a question of debate that actually has to emerge from 500 million people talking together. So I started thinking, I have a set of theories and I uh, read many other people's theories, and there's a monumental amount of work done out there. So I was so happy I talked to people, and 99% of the people I talked to, they said, you're naive, it's impossible. And now, if you ask yourselves, how many of you, you truly believe that true democracy is possible? I'm not gonna ask people to put their hand up because there are so few people that believe in the ability of humankind to come peacefully to a, a huge agreement on the basics. We don't have to agree on everything, but we have to agree on the basics of our cohabitation and that is the constitution and the basis of democracy. Right, so everything is impossible, but everything is in everyone thinks it's impossible. But I would like to, I always bring this thing up. 100 years ago, Albert Einstein predicted the existence of gravitational waves. Those are things that you see every day. You know, every time a black hole collapses in the further galaxy, so many years after the space-time continuum oscillates. You know, that's very important. That's science. But who? I mean, I'm not saying it's not important. But who is going to reap the benefits of that science nowadays? It's the corporations, and it's not us, that's for sure. How much money was it invested in that gravitational telescope? Well, only 65 billion, with a B, euros. Now, the question that I would like to put to you is, do you think if the European Union invested not 65 billion, but just a couple of them, a couple of billion euros, 
to design the electronic platforms, the social, um, the social meeting points, the mechanism for us to talk to each other. If we put in just a couple of billion euros, how many, think, how many people think that we'll be much closer to true democracy than we are now? Now, I would imagine that there were more hands saying that, yeah, definitely that would help. Now, the thing here is that if you are in power, you are not going to do that. Because as Jan is very well quoted from Aristotle, democracy is the weapon of the poor, and we are all poor, to get power away from the rich. So those who have the power are never going to put those billion dollars, even less, just million euros, into discovering democracy, the new democracy. We have to ask ourselves, what does democracy on the 21st century mean? And the answer is, if they are not going to pay anyone to do it, it's only for us to do it. All those millions of euros of work that have to be put into the research and the development of democracy have to come from you guys. I mean, we're doing a bit, but everyone has to chip in effort, money, whatever. We have to, and that is truly grassroots. So you may think that, oh, these nine people, 50 people in Dublin talking about the European Constitution, it's not going to go anywhere. It will. It will. Because people are going to put the effort, and we're going to substitute the investment that people don't want to put on our effort with our hard work. So please join us in that hard work. Thank you. The last word, if I may. The question about the Constitution is not legal. It is not a luxury. It is not something that um, is reserved for intellectuals to, and, and polit the politically minded to, 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 to speak of. We are in Ireland, well, I have to remind myself every time of where I am because I'm always on an airplane. It's always wonderful to, to come back to Dublin only because this city is, um, uh, is very close to the, con to the concept of the polis. Anyway, that is an aside, which of course is the, the foundation of politics. Yeah? Um, let me say this. Here in Ireland, what happened about, when was it, eight years ago, when uh, Jean-Claude Grichet called the Prime Minister and said either you sign those promissory notes that are going to indebt Irish citizens forever, or we're going to close the banks down, and we're going to do untold damage to your society. Now, who gave Jean-Claude Grichet the right to issue such a threat. What treaty contained that uh, provision? None. A constitution is the only restraint on raw, unmitigated power. And the fact that we created the European Union and the European Monetary Union that does not have such, con such constitutional checks and balances has jeopardized a whole generation of uh, Irish people. Later on, when something similar happened to us in Greece, even Michael Noonan, in a Eurogroup meeting in which I participated, threw his hand, hands up in the air and said, you're asking me to pay, take a decision about Greece when I don't have a single page of A4 in front of me uh, informing me of what is at stake. The lack of transparency the fact that you cannot see what's happening in the Eurogroup, which decides your future. The fact that your own minister, who is in the pockets of the Troika, even he is protesting the fact that they're keeping him in the dark and feeding him manure as if he's a mushroom. <laughs> it's just another example of the exercise of abusive, raw power of the kind that constitutional societies were meant to over overturn. 
And finally, the question of participation. Allow me to bring a little bit of happiness into this amphitheater. I remember in 2011 when we had the massive protests against the austerity policies and the new toxic bailouts for the banks and so on that were being pushed through, through Parliament. I remember we had some, something like 500,000 people in one square. Um, and on that night, the police unleashed the largest concentration of chemical weapons, CS gas, um, in any city, anywhere in the world, within an hour and a half. But just before that happened, uh, I remember I was at the, at the, at the entrance of, 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 of Parliament, of the House of Parliament. Uh, and of course, there was there were thousands of people there, and they were all trying to stop the members of parliament of the governing party, which, by the way, was a socialist party. So the fact that it doesn't exist anymore is indicative of um, how smart that was on their behalf. Anyway, they were pushing through the memorandum policies, the austerity policies. You know, blah, blah, blah. you had this in the eyes. But I remember there were there was this one young, slim woman was uh, had climbed the wall and she was shouting at one of the ministers of the Socialist Party, a member of parliament, who was walking in there to vote for those measures. And she was actually screaming at him, don't do it, you do not have a mandate. And he turns towards her and says, who the hell are you to tell me what I should do? And she responded in a way that I will never forget. She said, who do I have to be? Thank you. OK, so uh, we'll have now an intermission, right? And uh, let's, um, it's 45 minutes, so 22 we are uh, receiving. Thank you so much for your attention.
Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody.
please all get us a chair somewhere so we can continue the program. Um, before we continue, I just wanted to make a couple of announcements. Um, the first one is because we uh, got a couple of questions we knew um, about the first half of the program where the gender balance was not ideal. <laughs> and we acknowledge this. Um, the thing was, luckily, during the World Cafe this morning and this afternoon, uh, we had a great many of uh, women actually participating in the World Cafe. Um, but at some point, um, we asked for um, uh, volunteers to join the panel. Um, and, and there, it, it, it were mainly the men who volunteered. This also shows something about politics, unfortunately, something that's still we, that we still need to nurture. Um, we need to nurture the involvement of everybody, not just of white academic males, of course. Um, and that is something that we have to work on in the future. Uh, luckily, our next panel, uh, in the next panel, the gender balance will be much more balanced. Um, and the other announcement that I wanted to make is we got a couple of requests uh, from people who would like to sign up actually for uh, DM. So therefore we made a list downstairs uh, where you can leave your name and your email address and also your city, the city where you're living. Um, so we can actually connect you to a DM local near to you. And we also would like to give the opportunity um, for people to leave their email addresses to be included in the mailing uh, for the people who would like to start their own local initiative. So their own DM25 uh, spontaneous collective, as we call it. Um, so you can do this all at the end of the event. We'll be sitting downstairs um, where you can sign up. Um, and now I would like to introduce to you the next part of the program. Um, and a little bit of a personal anecdote. Um, last year in February, I was in Amsterdam and I took the night bus uh, to Berlin. I'm not sure whether every anybody ever did this. A very last minute, um, and night buses are horrible. I, I would no, not really recommend it to anybody. So we went actually not directly to Berlin, but we went first to Groningen, and then to Bremen, and then to Hamburg, and then to Berlin. So I was wrecked in the end, and I didn't really know what I was doing. And eventually I en ended up uh, somewhere near the Volksbühne, because I he had heard about this event that was taking place there. And um, it all seemed like a bit of a weird... I didn't have a ticket as well. So I lined up, I waited for hours, and eventually I didn't get a ticket, so then I just went inside, and eventually, luckily, I managed to sneak in into the main room. And um, that was a moment when um, the opposite happened of what many of you have experienced, I think, this year um, during uh, the election of Trump in America or the happening of Brexit in the UK. At those moments, it feels like you wake up and the world has been shaken up in a very bad way, that you wake up in a bit of a dystopia. But there in Berlin, it was more like history clicked into, the, into its place, that something happened that needed to happen for years already, and finally happened there at that moment. And since then, DM has grown, and Finally, there is a transnational European movement, uh, something that was needed for many, many years already. And luckily then, no, I can't even believe that, that we are actually here today in Dublin, and I can introduce to you our panel, uh, Nessa Childers, Yanis Varoufakis, Aiden Reagan, Alice Mary Higgins, and Vincent Brown. So I would like to ask you to give a really, really big applause to our panel tonight. And I would <laughs> like to invite you to stage.
Good evening again. I'm going to say a few words about the European New Deal, which is the policy framework, economic and social policy framework of uh, DiEM25. I will speak to the reasons why we think it's important and then open up the discussion. Uh, I suspect that the best introduction is um, to compare and contrast two views of the Eurozone, two positions, two um, opinions, if you want, as to why the Eurozone should or shouldn't have uh, been uh, instituted. The first one comes in the form of a, of a story. It is 1992, end of 1992, the Maastricht Treaty had just been uh, approved, uh, at least by the elites in Europe. And there is a meeting happening in Brussels between two men of significance, of historic significance in the creation of the Eurozone, and an observer who is a good friend of mine, his name is Stuart Holland, he used to be a member of parliament in, in Britain, and he was an aide to one of the two men who were in that room. He was an aide to somebody called Jacques Delors. Do you remember him? He was the most powerful and most significant president of the European Commission uh, and responsible effectively for the ushering in of the Europe. And the other man was somebody called François Mitterrand, the president of France. Now, Stuart and Jacques were working together for quite a few months on what they considered to be an essential pillar of the new currency, which of course was never built. That was the growth pillar. Their view was that the European Central Bank that was being designed was going to be the pillar of financial stability, or price stability if you want, and then there would be a pillar of growth and um, economic and financial surplus recycling. This is how they had conceptualized it. So the idea is that the European Central Bank keeps prices more or less stable across Europe, and there is a growth pillar, the purpose of which is to take surpluses from where they are created and helps invest them directly into productive capacities in the deficit areas, which is an essential mechanism for any monetary union to be sustainable in the long term. Jacques Delors, with the help of Stuart Holland, had written this um, policy paper, a green paper, which included, which was based on, um, uh, on effectively turning the European Investment Bank into the equivalent of the European Central Bank, the, the growth pillar, to be juxtaposed against and to assist the pillar of, st of stability. So this, this, this is a green paper that never became a white paper. And th the story I'm going to tell you now concerns why it never became a white paper. In that room, Jacques Delors presented the green paper to Mitterrand and spoke for 22 minutes. At least this is what Stuart tells me. 22 minutes is a quite a long time to be lecturing the president of France. Um, and then he stopped. He, Stuart tells me that Jacques Delors put forward a very solid argument. And then Mitterrand looked at the ceiling for five minutes, which is a bit like a century. If you're in the room with the president of France while he's staring at the ceiling for five minutes and you're waiting to find out what his verdict is. His verdict was, Jacques, this is an excellent idea. We're not going to do it. And the reason why we're not going to do it is because Helmut and I Helmut Kohl, the Chancellor of Germany then, and I do not have the political clout to bring it about. We can just about bring about the monetary union, but we cannot do this. But then he added, but when in around eight to 10 years, this is quite prescient, the Euro currency area that we create enters a major financial crisis, smart man, eh? then our successors will be forced either to ditch it or to do what you're saying. That's one of the two views that I wanted to relate to you. The other one comes from a, 
a very good political economist from Cam Cambridge University, now deceased, Nicholas Calder, uh, one of the uh, successors, if you want, of John Maynard Keynes at the University of Cambridge, and possibly the last of the John Robinson after that, Cambridge University, were to the dogs, so to speak, <laughs> from an economics perspective. Thank you. Do you know any economists at Cambridge today? They're all insignificant. Uh, he's on his own, and he's, he's not considered an economist. He's in the development studies thing. Huh? Anyway, yeah, but he's good. Oh, look, there are some good people, but there's no one substantial, really. So, Nicholas Calder, April 1971, April 1971, that is before the collapse of the Bretton Woods system, he was already noticing that the Europeans could sense that the Bretton Woods is in the dollar zone. Back then, we were all part of the dollar zone. Yeah? All our currencies were linked to the dollar, fixed exchange rates, more or less. So we had a currency union run by the United States. And that collapsed a few months after. Now, Calder wrote this article in the New Statesman, in which he warned Europeans. From the perspective of a Europeanist, he was not a Eurosceptic. He was a pro-European. Brit. And he said this, if we make the mistake of creating a common currency before we create a political and fiscal union in the false hope that it will be the first step towards a political union, what is going to happen is the common currency area that we will create is going to get into such a deep financial crisis at some point that that crisis will generate demonic forces awful forces that will tear us apart and make a political union absolutely impossible. Well, who was right? Mitterrand or Calder? Anyway, this is in lieu of an introduction. I be certainly believe that uh, the developments of the last 10 years have proven that Mitterrand was wrong. He was right to predict that the common currency without a common surplus recycling mechanism, to put it briefly, uh, would produce a massive financial crisis. Mitterrand s saw that. But he was wrong to think that the massive financial crisis was going to spawn a political process leading to in further integration, to a political union. You can see what is happening. Now we have the celebration of multi-speed Europe, because f Euro the European Union is fantastic at fighting euphemisms by which to take a disaster and to give it a name that makes it look like a success. So instead of having integration, we have disintegration, and we call it multi-speed. So we celebrate multi-speed Europe. Um, instead of mourning the loss of the, n of the dream of unity and convergence. So, you heard about the Volksbühne event in Berlin when on the 9th of February 2016, we created, Nessa was there, one of the founding members, um, we created the, from that, well actually the next day after we recover from the hangover of that night, um, we set out to do that which the European Union has not done. To answer the question, what policies, what tinkering of existing institutions would give rise to a process that would stabilize the Eurozone and therefore stabil sta stabilize the European Union, which is being disintegrating as a result of the Euro crisis? Now, you notice that a few weeks ago, Emmanuel Macron won in, uh, in France. Uh, DiEM25 supported him in the second round, not in the first round, against Le Pen, uh, as is the want of any progressive person who doesn't want to see Le Pen being president of the French Republic. Now, his proposal for the Eurozone is very similar to that which my friend Stuart Holland and Jacques Delors were putting forward in 1992. Very similar, very similar. It's actually a little bit more advanced than that. Um, I'm afraid he's going to fail. He's going to fail because it would have been fantastic to have introduced it in 1992 or 1999. But now it's too little too late. Anyone who goes to Berlin and proposes a kind of federation light, because this is what it is. It's a federation light, a light version of like Coca-Cola light, right? Uh, to um, either the Christian Democrats or the Social Democrats is going to receive the standard sermon. 
we cannot, at this stage, go to our electorate and propose to them a treaty change because that treaty is simply not going to pass through Parliament. And if we put it to a referendum, it's uh, going to be rejected. And therefore, the rules are the rules are the rules. Forget about all these changes. So this is what Macron is going to get now. He's already gotten them. The day after he was elected, Merkel, Schäuble, and Martin Schulz, the leader of the opposition, came out and said, ah, oh, we have the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, the bailout fund. What, why do we need um, other institutional changes? Uh, it's like saying we need the Troika in Paris. That's what it means. Because the ESM is, is the Troika. Uh, and th th this is not exactly the idea of a political union, to have the Troika everywhere, right? This is called occupation. Um, so, when we were putting together our European New Deal paper, and could I possibly plead with you to go into our website, dm25.org, and look at our European New Deal paper? It's a bit tough going because it's technical, as it should be, but it, it is our, our answer to the question of what needs to happen and what can happen along the lines of both pragmatism, realism, and radicality. Because we need something that is radical, that is not too little, too late, and something that is pragmatic, something that can be implemented tomorrow morning. But what does, that what does it mean to say that it needs to be implementable tomorrow morning? Well, something that does not need treaty change. Because the moment you ask for treaty change, this is the standard answer you get. So not requiring treaty change is a necessary condition, it's not a sufficient condition. To have a sufficient condition, of course, you have to have a political movement throughout Europe that is pressurizing governments and pressurizing existing political forces to accept it. But it is a necessary condition. So allow me to be very brief um, in, in describing only one third of the European New Deal. The European New Deal is um, uh, our policy framework it has three phases. Something that we can do tomorrow morning to stabilize particularly the Eurozone and stabilize not just the economics but also the politics of Europe so that we can then have a discussion about treaty change once we have stabilization. If we expect to have treaty change in order to stabilize, we're finished. So short term, then medium term, what ne can be done and should be done in two to five years, and that involves treaty change, and long term. And part of the long term is, of course, the European Union con constitution that we discussed in the first part. But I will only give you some hints as to what we are proposing for the short term, for Monday morning. What can happen on Monday morning? Let's say that um, we were running the European Union. What would we do without um, radical treaty change based uh, alterations? Now imagine a press conference in Brussels, which involves the President of the European Union Council, Mr. Tusk now, it's very, very difficult to imagine, but anyway, imagine for a moment. We are economists who can assume anything. The President of the European Central Bank, the President of the European Investment Bank, and the President of the Bailout Fund, the European Stability Mechanism. And the announcement is the following. The European Union Council, ladies and gentlemen, has given the green light to the European Investment Bank to embar embark upon a large-scale green investment-led recovery program to the tune of 5% of Euro area GDP. So the EIB will be investing 5% of our total income in the Eurozone on green energy and uh, renewable energy and research and, and development in uh, green sustainable transition uh, directly without the participation of government into the economies of um, the Eurozone, North, South, West, East, and the center, of course. Where will the money come from? The European Investment Bank, for 25 years now, has been issuing its own bonds. Well, it will have to issue a lot of them. Why doesn't it do it now? Because they fear, it's a very conservative institution. I was a governor of that in splendid institution. I can tell you they want to do it. But they they're scared that if they do it, if you issue so many bonds, their price will go down, the interest rates will go up, and their cost of borrowing are going to be 
are going to um, escalate. This is why we need the President of the European Central Bank sitting next to the President of the European Union Council and the European Investment Bank to make the, the interjection that the European Central Bank is standing by in secondary markets ready to purchase those bonds and only those bonds uh, if their price falls be below a certain level. Just that announcement will ensure that it will not fall below that level. That is a new deal. The new deal of Franklin Roosevelt was all about soaking up excess savings during the Great Depression. A depression is a very interesting phenomenon because you have a mountain of debt and at the same time a mountain of idle savings. And the only way of overcoming it is by taking the mountain of idle savings and putting it to work, transforming it into investments in productive capacity to produce the, the, the incomes from which the debts will be repaid. So this is the recycling mechanism that needs to be introduced now in exactly the same way that it was introduced under the New Deal by Roosevelt. The problem is that unlike Roosevelt, we don't have a federation. We don't have common debt to do it. And if you start pro proposing like Macron that we're going to have to create common debt in order to deal with this situation, we will hit on the wall of the Berlin rejection of treaty change. But the European Investment Bank can do it tomorrow morning, on Monday morning. This announcement is completely consistent with existing rules, regulations and treaties. It can happen tomorrow. Then the question is what do we do with our debt? The Irish debt, public debt, the Italian debt, the Greek debt, the Spanish debt, this, the French debt. Well, here we propose again something that can be announced in the same press conference. Split the debt, public debt of every country into two parts. The part which was allowed by Maastricht, the 60% of national income, if you, if you recall, and the rest. And have the European Central Bank service at zero interest rates, or almost zero interest rates, the good part of the debt, the debt that we were allowed to have according to Maastricht. And how will the European Central Bank do that? Well, by printing? No, because the Germans don't like that. And we will be printing in order to support the European Investment Bank? No. By issuing its own bonds. The European Central Bank can issue its own bonds, not the same thing as printing money. Selling it to investors in Germany, in Ireland, in China, whoever wants to purchase a safe bond, and there's nothing safer than an ECB issued bond, not a German bond, not an Italian bond, not an Irish bond, an ECB bond. And who pays for this bond? Who redeems it? It's not the ECB, we don't want, the ECB is not allowed to do this according to its charter, but suppose that the ECB has issued some of these bonds for the Irish government to service the good part of the Irish debt, then the Irish government will have to service those. So the ECB will immediately issue a bond, sell it to a Chinese investor, service the good part of the debt of Ireland, open an account for the, for the Irish state in the ECB and say to them, look, this is a 10 year bond, in 10 years I want you to have repaid this amount but at the interest rate which is next, next to zero. And the benefit of that is that if you do this for every member state, effectively 60% of your area GDP worth of debt is going to be serviced for the next 20 years at zero interest rates, independently of what the interest rates of the European Central Bank are in the long term. Suddenly you have a major restructure of all debt. The debt crisis goes away. My estimation is that about 38% of all debt will go away. If you make with one press conference, 38% of, of total public debt disappear, it's gone. Uh, the crisis is gone. And finally, with banks. Every time a bank fails, you know this here in Ireland, and uh, Vincent will have a lot to say about this, <laughs> or maybe not. You already know it. I don't think, Vincent, you need to say anything. Everybody knows the situation <laughs> with the banks here. It's the same in Greece, same in Italy. Uh, if, if you look at what is now happening in Italy, I mean, they're all failing left, right, and center, especially the Venice banks now, they're all kaput. Uh, and what is happening is that the, the, the fiscally stressed, quasi-insolvent Italian government has to bail those ba insolvent banks out. So this debt embrace between insolvent banks and insolvent uh, states is continuing. How do you stop this? Well, suppose we, in, as part of the same press conference, we announced that every time uh, some bank fails, like the Venetian banks now in Italy, the government of the land can say, ah, we don't want to have anything to do with it. So we create a new jurisdiction 
Eurozone jurisdiction uh, that um, is at the empty set. There's no bank in it. But if a bank fails and the government says, well, I'm not going to, I, I do not want to have to pay for its recapitalization, it immediately, what we do is we fire the board of directors of the bank. The European Central Bank, the SSM, uh, replaces the board of directors with people who are not Italian so that you break down that cozy relationship between local bankers and local politicians. The European Sen uh, Stability Mechanism, the bailout fund, provides capital if it's necessary. And then within a year or two, they have the remit to sell back that bank to the private sector throughout Europe. So you, ro you Europeanize the failing banks and you break this death embrace between um, uh, insolvent banks and insolvent states. Now. And finally, the same, th by the way, th we are in 30 minutes now, 20 minutes into a press conference that has sorted out the Eurozone crisis, but we need one more uh, pillar to this solution. Uh, you know, in the United States, again, I w uh, I'm going to refer to, the to so some of the good things about the United States. There is so much awful stuff coming out of the states these days. Well, always, but especially these days under Trumpism. But nevertheless, they have some um, features that we should uh, plagiarize because they're excellent. Now, you know about the food stamp program. Poor families receive in the mail in the United States, whether they live in Wisconsin, in Alaska, in Texas, in Missouri, or in California, or indeed in the, in the city of New York, New York. They receive a check in the mail signed by the head of the central bank, the chair of the Fed, Janet Yellen now. Uh, it's a check that they can take to the supermarket and purchase food and put it on the table. You have no idea, or oh, I'm sure you can imagine, what a unifying effect that has. When poor families receive that check signed by the chair of the Fed, they feel American. They feel that they belong. Imagine if a family in Cork, a family in Athens, indeed a family, poor family in Berlin, were to receive such a check signed by Mario Draghi. I mean, I'm saying this and it's very incredulous, but never, you know what I mean. We would feel European. And all this could be um, funded through the profits that the European Central Bank makes from the various accounting systems that it has, from the, like Target 2, the profits of Target 2, but primarily these days, the huge income that it makes from its quantitative easing program, the purchases of bonds to the tune of 80 billion, between 70 and 80 billion a month, or those bonds um, leave a substantial profit to the European Central Bank. Well, why not use that? This is not taxation. Our Central Bank makes profits. Well, use that in order to send these checks to poor families throughout Europe as a unifying um, solidifying act of genuine solidarity, unlike the bailout funds were, which were given to our, country, to our countries uh, supposedly under the guise of solidarity when all it was, it was occupation. Now, there is a lot more that we are proposing in the European New Deal, but I, I just wanted to give you a whiff of the kind of ideas that are possible, pragmatic, and at the same time radical. And ideas that could be applied on Monday morning, and the only reason why they are not applied is because of the toxicity of our politics and the political coordination failure. I think I've spoken far too long, but I want, again, we need you to comment on our European New Deal paper. It is not the depository of all wisdom and truth. It needs a lot of work. It is always going to be work in, program, in progress. We want it to be uh, constantly updated. We want it to be uh, modified for the needs of particular countries. So the European New Deal should have as a chapter of it, which doesn't yet, uh, the Irish New Deal, the Greek New Deal, the French New Deal, uh, and to provide at last this uh, antidote to there is no alternative. Thank you. Nessa.
is my microphone working? You can all hear me. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here, and of course, everyone says that very often when they're about to uh, speak to the public, but I really mean it. And I think it's significant that, that it's important because it's very rare now, being an MEP, that I'm actually on a platform with like-minded people. And uh, that, is a, that should scare everybody. Uh, I can't see you because there's a spotlight, and uh, that's a little bit disturbing. But here's the thing. It occurred to me that many politicians now are quite happy with that situation. They do not want to see the faces of their audience. They're in the spotlight, but they don't want to see the faces of their audience. They don't care. Um, and uh, we're all in big trouble for that reason, but perhaps we have been for as long as democracy has existed. Um, and I've been a politician for 13 years, and uh, that has been, for me, in some ways, a process of the progressive, or an unfortunate word perhaps, dismantling of illusions um, over those years, because I was too old, I think, when I became a politician. I was 47, and it was, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I thought things that were simply not true. But I can tell you something, coming from that position, there is nothing like DM. There is no organization that I have seen in all those years like DM, which is why I support it. And, uh, of course, there will be problems for DM. Um, I'm sure there will be enemies at the gates at some point, uh, and they won't all be from the centre-right. And I can tell you, as a politician, those enemies will be there, um, and I'm sure everyone will know how to deal with that. Uh, but I am a politician myself, and sometimes I feel like uh, basically confessing to it as if it was some kind of criminal offence to be one. In fact, I think there may be only two. There's Alice, Mary and myself are the only two politicians in the room. Um, and, uh, you know, we all have similar characteristics uh, which have to be suppressed sometimes in the service of the people we represent. So we're talking about a new deal for Europe. Um, and how have we gotten into a situation like this? My own fate, I, somebody was talking about the night bus to Berlin. Everyone has a kind of a journey that they've gone on, and that's a very good description um, of what happened there. You know, everyone has a journey, and this process of disillusion is sometimes really necessary. And mine was certainly, and many other, uh, possibly many other people, uh, and also politicians, uh, was bound up with the fate of Greece and what happened there and what we saw. And I always think of it as an unmasking. The banking crisis in the EU unmasked the true face of the European Union and the solutions, the so-called solutions that were imposed on citizens. And it had nothing to do with economics and the, you know, the economics of, of, of their attitude to Greece was, it wasn't economics, it was a form of insanity, it was politics um, and not economics. And that should worry everybody because, of course, it's still happening. And uh, it, in Ireland, Greece and Cyprus, the unmasking reached, it, it began. That's when everybody saw what was really going to happen. The Eurogroup has, it is completely lacking in transparency. Yanis has already explained this. And in his book, you can see what actually happened there. But I think it's important at this point to, to talk about how the existence of one person can actually set in motion something like DM, for instance, then to, to set in motion its existence and for it to progress. Yanis was that person. And what happened to him and Greece is absolutely indicative of the problems of, I don't know what you would call, the, the awfulness of the way the Eurogroup behaved, but also of politics as a whole, because you could see what was happening. There was, I think, the first Eurogroup meeting that you were at was delayed. We were all still awake in Strasbourg, and there was just a picture of a platform with the European stars behind it, and no one came out. Everyone, you were, you, you were all, all waiting. There were things going on behind the scenes. 
And uh, when Janus came out, it only took about half an hour. And this is how far I had descended into the political life, if you like. I could tell that they were not going to be able to tolerate him at any level at all. And that they, at some, pe people were somewhere behind the scenes saying, my God, we have to get rid of this man. There were probably people, I, I believe, at a transatlantic level saying that. And politics, politics... It expels what they feel as alien organisms uh, from their midst, and that's what the Eurogroup did. And to be honest, they also, you know, I know Alexis Tsipras, I've said this before, is a, is a controversial figure, but uh, some time later, they, they locked him in a room in Brussels and basically tortured him into agreeing to a bailout. They locked him in a room. I believe people weren't allowed to leave until 6 a.m. So, you know, just think about that. Think about what it means. And we mustn't ever get used to this happening. We mustn't begin to think that it's the norm. I'm afraid quite a few European politicians don't react like that. It seems as if this is, well, it's okay that you torture. Uh, people that you expel them. Ma I mean, Yanis is a is a macro econo uh, economist, is an economist, and you know he knew what he was talking about. And it appears that some of the others thought so too. But in public, they couldn't stand it because they were all under the influence of, for instance, the likes, likes of uh, Wolfgang Schäuble, um, who were you know there were just politics everywhere. So. You know, what do we do now? What do we do? I mean, Greece is still in a... I can't believe that anyone thinks that Greece is now has been rescued in any way. If you look at the figures, you just think somebody... Does, and is, does anyone really believe this? And what is going to happen when the third phase or the fourth phase, what when there's another election there? Who will be elected? Who is going to stop this situation happening? I think the IMF could stop it. I don't know why they don't. Um, but, you know, that brings us back to DM, and the fact that I think it is a very unusual organization and some kind of political engagement may have to happen uh, because, for instance, you know, at some point, the European, well, let me go back to uh, my experience in the European Parliament. I'm a member of the group of socialists and democrats. I find that very difficult too, because I listen to endless talk about the existential crisis of socialists and democrats. And not very much insight into the fact that they have brought it on themselves. Or in fact, we, if I'm being honest, not very much insight. Uh, there is a complete avoidance of this. Um, and it's, I find it a very uncomfortable position uh, to be in because I hear this talking all the time um, about how the messaging is wrong. And politicians do this when they, when, they know something, when they know they failed and that they're going to lose seats. They're sort of panic stations about messaging. It's not about messaging. It's about the messenger. It's about the policies in the first place and not wanting to see the faces of your audience. You know, that's what it's about and not listening. And in the case of many Labour parties and, you know, social Democrats in Europe, becoming collusive in the process of bailouts and carrying out neoliberal policies. And that's what's happened and it's going to continue to happen unless it's stopped. And I'm not sure what the solution is there because, of course... You know, you could say a bit like you said about Macron that you know, if you're to choose between the EPP, for instance, and the others, uh, you know, so social democrats are at least not that. Um, but Macron, I, I would say, you know, Macron, there are some there are some problems with his, his policies. I think he he has neoliberal tendencies. He will run into huge difficulties if he tries to change, for instance, French labour law. I think that he will run into enormous difficulties. And he, but he has the, the socialists in France in a complete panic politically, um, which in my opinion is no bad thing. Um, <laughs> so... Um, and another, uh, you know, we have seen in the, the socialist group, we, I have seen, uh, for instance, the, the CETA trade agreement. 
um, that thir only 30% of us voted against that. Now, Alice Mary has done a lot of work here on CETA. I don't think uh, the Irish political class would have any notion of anything to do with CETA if it hadn't been for Alice. We sleepwalk into trade agreements without even thinking about them. Um, but the socialist group voted for it, except for some of us, without really even knowing why. It was a kind of an attitude. We have to vote for some trade agreement. We didn't vote for TTIP, so let's vote for CETA despite huge mobilizing of grassroots movements about those two, uh, uh, those two trade agreements. And that's where the future lies with grassroots movements and with DM, um, because they push politicians into behaving in the correct way by making them frightened. And I've always said this, whenever I talk to groups that are special interest groups, um, one of the things you have to do uh, with politicians is make them frightened about losing their seats and losing power and then you have some influence that's a, it sounds like a terrible thing to say but I'm afraid it's true um, for many of them so we know what's happened we know in many ways what's happened we now have a situation where globalization has damaged people's lives we have lost uh, manufacturing industries in many European countries in the UK for instance that is that was definitely one of the reasons that the vote for Brexit occurred we have to decide what to do about that. And that's part of the new deal for Europe. That's part of the, you know, dealing with debt and looking at economics in a completely different way. Perhaps we should start really seriously thinking about the idea of a basic income. You know, I know there are huge problems associated with it, but how else do we give meanings to people's lives who may not have work in the future? Automation isn't going to stop. So what's going to happen to people's minds, let alone their incomes and uh, the way they live? So these are all issues that I think DM has to talk about, um, as, as well as its own future path. And I'm delighted to be in it. I'm a member of the uh, advisory board, and uh, I hope more politicians here will become involved in it. And I look, I've said probably as much um, as is useful for me to say. So I'm going to hand who, who's next to... turned on yeah okay yeah so I'm just going to um, one moment now uh, so thank you for the invitation to say a few words here today I can't see anybody here either which is a bit strange unless I put my, my hands up like this um, so <coughs> I suppose everybody's starting off with an anecdote or a story so I tell a slight story about the European Commission before getting into my three-point response to what Yana said and what a new deal for Europe might look like um, every year I take 30 students over to Brussels and we visit the European institutions, the European Parliament, the Commission, uh, the European Investment Bank, uh, the European Court of Justice. And two years ago, we went to the European Commission uh, and somebody from the Economic and Financial Affairs Commission gave a talk on fiscal union, completing the monetary union. Martin Larch, who's the chief architect of a lot of the policy ideas behind um, what goes on in, in ECFIN in particular, uh, he's also a co-author with Marco Buti, who's the Director General of the Economic and Financial Affairs Commission. And he gave the classic kind of speech on, well, to complete the monetary union, we need to have supply-side structural reforms, which basically means that every country in the EU needs to flexibilize their labor market, flexibilize their product market. And if they do, the competitive gains of having uh, export-led growth will generate the type of conditions that will lead to long-term growth. You can pay off the debt and you'll reach the utopia of a complete monetary union. This is a very fanciful idea but that's all it is, it's really just an idea. But to try to implement it obviously has huge implications because you're talking about basically breaking up trade unions, you're talking about trying to dismantle collective bargaining institutions, you're talking about imposing fiscal rules on governments such that they cannot make public investments, you're talking about the implication on, well, anything to do with fiscal policy where it comes to housing and so on. So afterwards, and during afterwards, he, he turned around and he looked across, he said, oh, you're the guy that said that Ireland's economic recovery has got nothing to do with austerity or the troika. And I said, yes, that's correct. And he's like, oh, okay, let's talk about this. So we had a conversation and I outlined why I thought that basically, well, you could call austerity induced cost competitiveness had nothing to do with the Irish recovery. And we had a nice conversation. We kept up in conversation by email. I sent him some research. I sent him some papers and we kept up the dialogue. So next year, 
we went back uh, and I thought, okay, after the conversation, maybe, you know, we'll invite Martin Larch to speak again. So Martin Larch came in, different group of students, 30 students, and he basically gave the same speech, identical. And I said to him afterwards, oh, but like, you didn't have any, you know, reconsider some of your ideas, perhaps, based on the conversation, you know, you're kind of holding. And he just shrugged his shoulders and said, well, you know, th that's the narrative here. That's, that's the policy here. And I said, but it doesn't work. It's not true. It's not real. And he's like, well, you know, maybe it will, will be one day. So that's the type of people we're dealing with here. This is what the technocracy of the European Union uh, really means. I suppose what I've taken away from that is, and it's hard enough, I suppose, as an academic, as a social scientist, to realize that no matter how much empirical information you put out there, no matter how much falsifiable arguments you put out there, no much how much you demonstrate that what actually works and what does not work, it doesn't make a difference as long as somebody has a belief system that says otherwise. And that's difficult as an academic, so academics tend to be quite pessimistic on that basis. So I'm going to try to be optimistic today, which is a rare thing for a social scientist. And the three points I would say in response to the New Deal for Europe are as follows. And I have a nice idea for a paper now, Caldor and Mitterrand, uh, a New Deal for Europe. And the first one, the first observation starts from this idea of the European Investment Bank. <clears throat> We're constantly told in the European Union, in Europe, I'll just say Europe for short, and in particular in the Eurozone, but let's just say Europe, that Europe is poor, that you know we don't have resources, that we cannot make investments, that we cannot make investments in housing, we cannot improve the physical infrastructure of our cities, we cannot improve the quality of childcare, we cannot improve the quality of our education systems because the fiscal space, etc., won't allow it. Which is rather ironic when you think about it and you look at the data, because Europe has never been richer, actually. Uh, the total capital stock in Europe today equals about six to seven times national income of the European Union, which basically multiply 18 trillion by seven, and you'll get a total market value of how much resources are available within the EU today. So what does that suggest? It suggests that we're privately rich, but publicly poor. There's lots of private wealth, there's lots of private riches, but publicly, we're poor. Publicly, the state cannot make the type of investments that are necessary to improve the quality of life of its citizens. And of course, that narrative has become embedded in, somebody had mentioned, Yanis had mentioned on Tina. And it's true because our governments are poor. Our governments are in debt. So we've constantly been told that we're in debt. We have to tighten our belt. We have to reduce public debt. And then you think about what exactly is public debt. Well, public debt is private wealth. As public debt goes up, so does private wealth. Because instead of borrowing or instead of taxing wealth, we choose to borrow from those who hold wealth, with the implication being that the state itself goes into debt, has to pay interest on its borrowings, and those who hold those borrowings effectively get an interest and generate more wealth. So at the same time as we're being told we're publicly poor, which we are, we're increasing private wealth. And I think that's the first observation of any new deal for Europe has to start from. Europe is not poor, it's rich. And therefore the question is how do we, what do we do with that? And how do we ensure that governments are not poor. That leads me to my second point, and of course you could measure this in terms of the capital income ratio. It's high in Europe. Second point, how would you go about mobilizing that wealth for productive use? Anybody who lives in Dublin will know infrastructure is poor, transport systems are relatively dysfunctional, the healthcare system has lots of problems, housing is dysfunctional. So how would you go about trying to mobilize all that private wealth for productive use? And you can have a kind of regional deal for each individual country based around city states or whatever it is. Well, the obvious solution would be, well, you would nationalize all the wealth, you'd take it into public ownership and you'd use it in that way. Personally, I wouldn't be in favor of that. I think that's not really realistic. So this, the only solution really is a fiscal solution. How do you generate the capacity to tax that wealth in order to use it for public uh, investment. And I think that's exactly where something like the European Investment Bank can come in. The European Investment Bank has the capacity. It can be done quite easily. But the general inference to be drawn from that observation is that the EU, any transnational European movement, will go nowhere unless there's some sort of social contract that allows for tax and spend capacity. Right now, the EU is not a fiscal state. It's not a social state. It does not raise revenue, and therefore it cannot make investments. Most countries in the EU, taxation as a percentage of national income is 40 to 50%. Some countries are a lot lower, like Ireland and the Eastern Central European states. 
the EU is less than 1%. So there is no fiscal capacity. So any transnational movement has to have some sort of social contract to sell to European citizens. We're going to tax the wealth and we're going to have revenue raising capacity. And how would you go about doing that? Of course, we could talk all day and I'd be curious to hear what other people have to say about how you would generate that revenue raising capacity. Let's assume you had that capacity. Let's assume that there was ability to tax wealth. And I would be very much in pushing that type of policy forward. Instead of taxing labor income, which most people use, and most people rely upon the labor income, you basically tax unproductive capital. Because all that wealth, all that, we all that capital wealth that's available within the European Union today, the vast majority of it is just sitting there idle. It's not doing anything. It's not making any productive uh, contribution to society. So therefore, have you got some sort of democratic state capacity to tax it? Let's say 1% over a million net value of assets, 5% over 5 million, 10% over 1 billion. There's lots of innovative ideas that you could come up with. And these are very practical uh, and implementable solutions if you had the political will uh, to go beside it. Then the third point is, we have wealth, we have taxes. Well, what would you spend the wealth on? What would you spend the taxes on? If the EU and a transnational movement had an ability to tax unproductive capital, raise revenue, what would it do with that revenue? I think in response to technological change, in response to the increasingly dualized nature of our labor markets, which is happening almost everywhere, whereby you have high-tech, high-wage sectors and low-tech, low-wage sectors and hollowing out of the middle. There's lots of research done on this and we could talk all day about it. Personally, I'm in favor of a practical policy solution to deal with that, and that is a basic income. And a, ba a basic income guaranteed to all European citizens, funded through taxes on unproductive capital and wealth, to me sounds like a pretty good social contract that every European Union, every European citizen uh, could sign up to. And again, we could talk and debate about what that basic income would look like or mean. But that would be my three solutions, effectively, or three policy responses to a new deal for Europe. Tax wealth, unproductive capital, and spend it on a basic income, basically. I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, yeah, I'm also very excited to be here. And I know, uh, even though I can't see the face, I know some of the people who are out there. I know there's at least one other. Uh, politician in my, my good colleague, Senator Lynn Muan. I know that there's activists who've been working you know, for years um, in Ireland trying to raise issues and keeping these issues and keeping that question of what Europe should be on the table um, all the time. And I also got a, a chance this afternoon at the, at the workshop and at the cafe to meet some of the people who took part in the discussion. I think it was an exciting discussion around, um, around what Europe might be and what we might make it into together. So I'm very happy uh, to be part of this. And it's also a great act of faith um, to see people coming to these discussions and being here. And it's at a time when trust across Europe is at an all time low. Tr trust uh, in national institutions, in European institutions. And we know that not just because we, we hear it in the conversations we have, we know it in, in Europe's own measurements, in the Eurobarometer uh, for about Five or six years now, it's been sending warning bells about extraordinary numbers who are falling away from their belief in the democracy or the potential even for democracy in Europe. Uh, I think we've moved past a point of democratic deficit, uh, which was talked about for so many years, into a, a democratic disconnect where people don't even see where the path might be. And I think that's um, a, a very dangerous time. Uh, of course, that's all been deepened by the, the crash and we've you know, her, we, we know and have heard um, about that, about the bailout of the, the banks, including the French and European banks. And, and the prescription, you know, European institutions, instead of engaging in dialogue, engaging in a diagnosis and giving this one size fits all deeply ideological pers neoliberal prescription for privatization, for liberalization and for austerity, policies which had been uh, never been shown to work anywhere in the world and which we knew going into it had never worked anywhere in the world. And during that period, um, I was working, before I was in politics, I worked for about um, 15 or 20 years in, in the NGO sector, and, and in various hats and various ways, uh, I had the opportunity to go and, and engage with EU officials. In fact, uh, uh, some of us, and I know some are in the room today, 
made a, an attempt to engage with the European semester process, which is the follow-on to the Troika, the, the conversation that EU institutions have with nation states, um, uh, and which lead to country-specific recommendations. So um, that was one of the conversations which we attempted to insert ourselves into. And it was very interesting meeting with EU officials because what you found in many of them, it was, it was so disheartening, was that it was all about the fiscal compact. It was all about the short-term fiscal targets. Uh, the vision documents which had been worked together for people in Europe, like the, the Europe 2020. It's a document you never hear about, but it was quite a nice document. It was about smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. Everyone in Europe worked and developed it together. Europe 2020 was gone. Juncker's narrow 10-point plan, including his trade goals and the fiscal compact targets, was all that was on the table and is all that was being focused on. And what I also, and I think uh, since we're all giving our anecdotes of our moments of encounter, but one of the more chilling moments that I had, and it was in a different capacity, at a different, it wasn't part of that process, but it was um, with an EU official who, who boasted, boasted about the fact that the European Commission had never accepted a citizen's initiative and probably never would. These are the citizens' initiatives signed by over a million citizens uh, across European states. It's a hard thing to achieve. It shows that a concern spans any one, uh, moves past any one nation and is a common concern across Europe. And, and I'll come back a little bit to the citizens' initiatives as well in a minute. But I think, uh, for me, I, it was chilling because it showed such a dangerous disregard for democracy and the fact that he didn't see that he was signing in a way, uh, he was sending a message and undermining um, Europe's very future. Um, in the consequences with Yanis and many others have talked about in terms of the rise of, of the right wing now, uh, the rise of, of neo-fascism, and of course the shock of Brexit, there's been a recent uh, scrambling in the European institutions to kind of dig up and find some of those values which we used to have underpinning. And, uh, it's interesting, the latest and the most recent uh, manifestation of that is the social pillar. So Juncker has produced, uh, in recent time, that's the president of the European Commission, uh, a, a social pillar. But it's notable how deeply inadequate that social pillar is. It, it focuses on the social and social rights as a subsection of the labour market. Uh, it talks about uh, reasserting our, our common social commitments and moving towards cohesion, but it doesn't acknowledge that it's exactly the, the, the divergence in the social and lived experiences of people across Europe in countries from Greece to Ireland to Germany um, that have been driven by recent policies. And in a, a kind of an extraordinarily bizarre, ironic and uh, a bizarre aspect of, of the new social pillar, it's both kind of ironic and I think um, mildly insulting to the public, is that the new social pillar uh, calls on nation states to aim for a social triple A rating. A social triple A rating. So the, the very uh, stock market rating systems which led to the financial crash were now being encouraged to take them. All those rating agencies who failed to regulate, who failed to spot the crash, let's take their systems off the peg and learn from them and use them to set up our framework for the social future of Europe. I mean, it's actually a, an extraordinary uh, point of hubris, um, uh, which in, in, in an interesting way. And Juncker also has said that he wants to sign off on these new policies at the highest level. And it shows that our European institutions and European structures, unfortunately, are still not getting the message they don't need more deals at the highest level. If we want to save Europe, and I'm passionate, and I know many here will be passionate, I'm passionate about saving Europe, about having a European future, we need to have it agreed. We need to rebuild credibility and confidence at the very ground level among citizens in Europe. We don't need another document at the highest level. We need something that builds from the base, not another top-down constitution, for example, but the kind of ground up uh, proposals that DM is trying to work for. And I think, um, for me, that democratic deficit, that, that bridging, that new, that new and innovative kind of democratic accountability we need from local to national to European to international level, I think DM 25 for me is an exciting part of that. Recognizing we are constantly 
remaking and expanding democracy. I mean, it's relatively new democracy in the, in the spectrum of the world and after the millennia of various authoritarian structures we've had. So it, it needs to be nurtured and remade. And I think DiEM25 is an exciting part of that. Um, there was a, a, a wonderful speech by a, trade, a UK trade unionist, uh, Francis O'Grady, um, just before Brexit, um, where she spoke about the fact, the sad fact, that over recent decades, uh, over a number of decades, um, many social democratic parties seem to lose their confidence in feeling that they could make demands or cha uh, change the market to ensure that the market served the social good. And uh, 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 she, has a, she had a very strong uh, message that she sent out. It was an impassioned plea um, for the left to have the self-confidence to interfere in systems and change them. And I think we do need to have that confidence of the left movements of a century ago in Ireland, in, in, the, in, the, in the lockout, when they were imagining kinds of futures uh, for, for workers' rights that seemed impossible, and uh, in the post-war period of Europe. Um, I have, uh, uh, I, I had looked at the DM document, I have lots of thoughts on it, but I'm going to just t touch on just a few. Um, I think uh, Yanis has already described the immediate measures so vividly that we were all at the press conference and I probably don't need to touch on those immediate measures again, um, except for maybe to add one point around that question of investment, because you know, in that need for, for public investment that, that Aitan was describing, we don't just have an obstacle of resources, we also have an obstacle um, in the structures that have been put in place, which actually make it hard for states to invest in public services, which demand states, for example, to invent special off-balance, special purpose vehicles. The idea that we cannot simply create and borrow money, that states cannot borrow money to create investment in infrastructure because the dividend is that long-term one in a happier, more productive society. Instead, they have to create special purpose vehicles, which brings a narrative of profit and of privatization to the fore. And I think it's also around um, not just giving the money, but allowing states to invest in this way. And of course, the delivery and the accountability of public services is one of the ways that states are accountable. It's how they build democratic credibility. We're not it's not just about people being able to access services. It's about the people who are able to access services also being able to have an opinion on those services and an outlet to express it and an accountability for those services. Um, and so a couple of the, the thoughts I had, I, I think the financial proposals are so exciting that are there from DM. Uh, the fact that the environmental proposals are very strong in it is important. And I do think two of the only positive things to have happened in recent years uh, being the, the Paris climate change targets, weak as they are, uh, but the Paris climate change commitments and the sustainable development goals. I do think we need to ensure that in this movement we keep those few small glimmers of light and keep them with us uh, as we move forward and create our vision. Um, I had some other thoughts on the interim things, but I think something more which I think could be done. Um, uh, I think the EU Parliament, again, I recognise that these are, uh, what was the phrase, uh, these are maybe necessary measures, but they're not sufficient. Obviously, they're not adequate. But the EU Parliament needs to be able to initiate legislation. I think that's important. Parliamentarians like Nessa need to be able to put forward proposals and, and, and not simply adjudicate. The fact of that exclusive competency to, to initiate legislation, the moment only the Commission can propose legislation. We need to change that. Um, the financial transaction tax, which has been floating in space for a long time, is our chance at a practice run for that European taxation system that we want to put in place. And I think that's something that we can, and it's nearly there, it could happen and should happen. Um, the, 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 another thing, I talked about the citizens' initiative, and uh, there was a, a, a very positive moment, a, a rare moment, the European Court of Justice uh, recently ruled against the Commission and they ruled that their willful ignorance, their willful ignoring, their willful refusal to take seriously and act on the citizens' initiatives, specifically the CETA citizens' initiative signed by over three million citizens across Europe, uh, is unacceptable and in breach of their duty. 
So we now have a situation where the European Commission has been told by the European Court of Justice that they need to take citizens' in initiatives seriously. And we need to flood them with citizens' initiatives. And we need to make sure that they are demanded to take action on them and that they know they will face further court cases if they don't. Um, and of course, that brings me to trade. And these are the, the last, the three areas that I think for me are crucial. And I'll just touch on each of them briefly. But, but trade, um, the vision for trade that we need to have. The European Court of Justice, as I say, it ruled on CD, but it also made another important ruling recently. It ruled that trade deals need to be ratified. They are not exclusive competence of the European Commission and they need to be ratified by all parliaments. Um, I think that the, the movement on TTIP and CETA has been one of the most successful uh, pan-European movements. It's taken in people politically and across, move, across civil society right across Europe. I was very happy to work with um, groups and, and activists in Ireland uh, to bring a motion to the, the Irish Senate. I think we were the first parliamentary group in Europe to vote against CETA. Of course, it wasn't binding, unfortunately, but it was an important vote and a signal. And I know that then Wallonia uh, really did take its stand in a very brave way. And we know those pressures. You talked about those overnight pressures and, you know, that the room is booked and uh, there's, a, there's a podium we want to go stand beside. And they resisted that. They did demand and delay and demand their own time for consideration. But now, uh, in this limbo of the seat, and I won't go into the detail, I'm, I'm sure... Some of you will um, uh, know about CETA and those who don't, um, uh, there's a brilliant document called Making Sense of CETA that everybody should read and we'll tell you all about it. But the point I wanted to go to more is I think that the DM movement needs to be more ambitious on trade. The proposal at the moment, the interim measure we have, it just looks for transparency in trade. We need to go way past transparency in trade. Every time the European Commission goes to negotiate a new treaty, they have to get a new mandate from the European Council. And I think we need to make sure that the next mandate that is given, which will be the mandate to negotiate the uh, trade deal uh, between Europe and the UK, that it is a different kind of mandate. There was extraordinary work done in the 90s on an alternative trade mandate for Europe, uh, back when some of us um, in the 90s and early 2000s were fighting the trade agreements that Europe was trying to impose on African nations. And there were great ideas about what a trade deal should look like, what kind of transparency it should have. And I think we need to be sending a message to Europe about what the trade mandate needs to be going into those discussions. And I think it's a, an opportunity now to do that. And we need to make sure that those trade deals do not include corporate courts. Um, another area which I think is crucial is peace. And, and we need to be be straight on peace. I mean, Europe came out of a time of war. The greatest dividend that Europe has had is peace. We know the fragility of peace. We saw it uh, as recently as the 1990s in the Balkans. And what's extraordinary is that despite having played an active role in, 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 in peace building and in, in securing people, despite that being in our, the core origin DNA of the, of the European Union, there has in recent years been a reckless disregard for peace building. And we've seen it in the kinds of policies imposed on Greece, in the social uh, disintegration that has been cultivated, in the language of division and scapegoating which has been used. This is, this is the stuff that dissolves and disintegrates peace. We know it from centuries. And yet there has been an irresponsible disregard for peace building. And even at the same time as we are not minding the peace, we have a new securitized narrative. We have a new narrative around militarization and around our borders. We've seen the militarization of the with borders with companies like Frontex and the new outrageous outsourcing uh, of detention centers in places like Libya. And, and this is why I bring this up for Ireland. I think something that Ireland has to offer, particularly into the DM movement, is that Ireland does have a record on peace building and it has a core record and it does have a status of neutrality, which I know we've undermined by the use of Shannon. But nonetheless, it is a mandate for neutrality, which is there. And that mandate has allowed us to play an international role, even, for example, in the peace negotiations in Colombia. And I think Ireland needs to be a champion for an active, positive vision of what it is to be peace builders. 
and we need to bring that into the European discussion. And we need to fight. There will be a push for a common European military force during the same period of time we are developing our constitution. We need to be ready to fight it along the way. Um, my last area I want to highlight, and I think it's one, and I recognize that there are actually many areas of intersection, uh, intersecting equality that need to be looked at. But I'm going to speak to one because it's important to me and it's one that I've, I've worked in for years and because I think it's, it's fundamental and that's around gender. I think it's the European Union did extraordinary things for, for gender equality in Ireland. Uh, it, was the, it was pressure not from, from the European uh, Court of Human Rights that dealt with, so it was of course Council of Europe, but you know, the, the, the end of the marriage bar, the maternity directive from Europe that introduced maternity leave. And it's been a constant pressure on our government and on our society that has helped drive Ireland from the 70s onwards towards some of the basic policies of gender equality. We have, however, seen in the last years and in recent years in Europe, um, a huge rollback on that agenda of gender equality and a pushback and a rollback and a backlash on it. Um, we've seen it in the, in, the, in the economic policies. So women have been at the absolute front line of the new precarious work. Uh, precarious work, we know that women are the majority of those in precarious contracts. Uh, so having fought for years for flexibility, we now have instead of flexibility, a precarious, insecure work reality, which leads uh, to dangerous power dynamics in the workplace and has set us back actually decades in terms of, um, in terms of, in terms of equality for women. And we've also seen that Europe, which used to have a strategy for equality between women and men, uh, last year, when it came to the point for renewal, decided that instead of a strategy, it would produce a strategic document uh, basically just a statement of vague aspirations. We're no longer looking for real goals. Um, but even as there has been that central rollback, the need for solidarity has never been higher. And I was lucky enough to be part of the European Women's Lobby for a number of years. And in the European Women's Lobby, we saw the importance of citizen solidarity, of social movement solidarity, of solidarity between women's movements and between other supportive movements. For example, uh, for civil society in places like Hungary, where they are being shut down, where civil society is being blocked and ended, where we see uh, we're in the point of detentions and laptops being seized, and we're seeing a very active, hostile war against civil society engagement. So it's needed now more than ever. And I think something I want to just say to as well, in terms of the, the economic and social movements, and I, I really welcome that DiEM identifies itself as a feminist movement, because I think economic and social movements are strengthened by feminist narrative. And we know that in Ireland, uh, back from the Irish Women Workers Union, uh, who were the first to put paid leave on the table. They were the first to even make that part of the agenda. It was the Irish Women's Workers Union who won two weeks holiday for all workers in Ireland, because it had never even been looked for before. And I think it was its gender budgeting that has driven the drive for equality budgeting and helped push on transparency and budgets. I think it's a crucial thing, and it comes to this as my very final point. I know I'm probably on time and uh, moving past, but, but, well, maybe it's my second final point. The participation and transformation. So, and, I'm, and I think um, we heard earlier and I'm in the first discussion, that idea of how we do it, Participation and the way we do it does matter um, if we have and really work on making it meaningful participation. The transformation we achieve is going to be more robust. It's going to stand up and it's going to work for everybody. And we need to say when somebody comes from a different experience from us, that that's a useful thing, that it allows us to see more of the bigger picture because oppression is complicated and patriarchy and capitalism and you know, racial uh, hierarchies, they are all entwined. So when we see insights from outside that deep, deeply embedded system from others, we need to welcome it and it's an opportunity. So I'm going to come just to the final point and I'm kind of, I don't want to end on the negative point, but I think we need to talk as well as the positive thing about disintegration. And, and Janice, what does disintegration possibly mean? Um, and who benefits from disintegration? It was very interesting to see the now disowned by the US, but during a brief month or two parading around Europe, um, supposedly uh, US envoy uh, Malik. And he spoke about 
we took down the Soviet Union and maybe there's another union that's ready for dissolution. And he spoke uh, just as recently as a few days ago um, about the importance of the strong nation state, that Europe should satisfy itself with being simply a trade bloc that allowed corporate access and stop on this goal for a common vision. And it's interesting when he says, because you think who benefits from disintegration? It's large powers who see a smorgasbord of small nation states who they can then look to control and treat in a clientelistic manner. And we saw after the collapse of the Soviet Union that the raw capitalist asset strimping of, of many, many nations that came out of that during that period. And I think it's crucial that we know there will be those who push for disintegration from the outside because it does benefit their geopolitical goals. And uh, in terms of the, um, the, the, the just the multi-speed Europe that's been pushed for, and I know there's some even on the left who say, well, maybe we should go for multi-speed because then we're not having to go with the full program. But it's diverting us into a conversation about speed when we need to have a conversation about direction. And the last thing I would say, going back to the theater is, and this is my last thing, it's a one-liner, but it is, it is around nationalism and a positive idea. When we talk about nationalism, um, and I think it's for Ireland, um, if we think of James Connolly as somebody who brought forward an idea of nation here, he was also an internationalist. And I think there is an absolute compatibility between nationalism and genuine internationalism. And I think the DM movement is going to be part of that. And I thank you very much. And I pass you on. I just thought I'd tell a story about Nessa's father, uh, who was president of Ireland, and it's a nice story, so don't worry about it. Um, he was running for the presidency in 1973, and he was in a bus, a campaign bus, with Jack Lynch, who was then very popular, had been very popular, Taoiseach, then leader of the opposition, and they were going through Cork, and there were people waving at the bus, and Jack Lynch said to uh, Nessa's father, Erskine, wave at them, and he said, but I don't know them. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I didn't read uh, the DM uh, document uh, because Yaris didn't tell me anything about it and uh, he, I assume he thought that uh, I would behave like a politician and give the same speech anyway, no matter what the topic was. <laughs> so... Um, <clears throat> I, I had advocated that uh, speakers should be allowed just four minutes. Um, <laughs> and I'll take no more than four minutes. I want to talk about just about three things, EU democracy, Irish democracy, and hegemony. First of all, EU democracy. I'm not sure that there can be such a thing. And for the reason is that there is no demos, there is no sense of collective in Europe. There's no, that I can't see a way that we in, the, in, in a European election would be arguing about European affairs as, as, uh, uh, as distinct from Irish affairs. And I suspect that's true in Romania, in Latvia, in Poland, in Germany, and, no, and Denmark, etc. So I don't think, because there isn't that sense of collective, that sense of identity, um, so I don't think it's going to work that way. However, there are certain things we could do. In my view, the big obstacle to democracy in Europe uh, is the Council of Ministers. Not the European Commission, it's the Council of Ministers. Uh, for there is where the power lies. And it operates in an entirely secretive way, and, um, uh, and there's no way of knowing what, uh, effectively what, uh, who votes for what and, uh, or who contributed what. So I have a suggestion, and it's not my... The the, origin, the originator of the suggestion, or the person I heard from about it first, was John Bruton, who was no uh, raving radical. Uh, and, and it is that instead of having a European Council, we have a Senate, and comprised of two members from each member state, and that, that all proceedings of the Senate would be held in public, and that the, the powers of the Senate would be extend right across the range of uh, competences of the European Union and the European Parliament would be given si similar competence.
Congress is rather like the um, Congress in the United States of America. I think that would be a very significant and, and important change. Um, also, that the other powerful institutions, and notably the ECB, be responsible to the uh, parliamentary bodies, the, the Senate and the European Parliament. I think it's just not acceptable that a hugely powerful institution is, uh, that has a huge impact on the lives of people in Europe as a whole has accountability to, to nobody at all. That's just not acceptable. Of course, it happens here in many ways. <laughs> um, we, uh, let me go on to the, uh, the, the Irish issue. We have a, we, in my view, we have a, a democratic deficit in Ireland. Not just deficit, we have an, a, a democratic uh, um, crisis now is too, uh, too extreme. But in any event, that... Uh, the, the idea of democracy, I, I, the Rousseau's idea of democracy, I think it was that instead of the is, instead of the sovereign uh, ruling subjects, that the, the the people who previously were subjects become sovereigns as well. So the people are sovereigns and subjects, and I think that's really a good idea. And we rarely, w w the way our systems work generally, and this obviously particularly so in the case of the European Union. The sovereign is the European people, or in, Ar in Ireland's case, the Irish people. It's not a government, it's not even a president, it's not a, a, the courts. The sovereign is the Irish people. And we've got to find ways of making that real and making that happen. And I suggest a number of ways. There are people here from direct democracy, and I think the direct democracy idea is a good one, namely that, we, that when 100,000 people, or whatever number is agreed, uh, sign a petition for a particular issue or to go to a public vote, that that should, be, uh, that should happen and that that vote uh, on, by the people as a whole sh uh, should, um, should, uh, should prevail over any decision of any parliament. But in addition, uh, I think that uh, we have got to have term limits in our parliaments, that the, the same old, uh, uh, and also change the way that we have ministers. At present, the primary preoccupation of, mo of a great number of our members of parliament, uh, we call them TDs, um, yes, is to get elected next time. And it's a career, it becomes a career for them. And therefore, they're afraid to do anything that might jeopardize their careers and, and say, afraid to take any initiative that might jeopardize the careers. But they're also afraid to do anything that might um, uh, cause insult to party leaders uh, because then that would jeopardize their chances of getting ministerial jobs. And this is hopeless. So in my view, we should have <laughs> term limits. That nobody can be elected more than twice, that the terms be reduced to three, three years each. And that would enable a lot of people to say, okay, I'll give it three years, I'll go into politics and I'll do my bit and then move on or maybe even t take it for six years if, uh, if they get re-elected. And the, the turnover of people in our society that would have experience of dealing with political issues would be vastly increased. And I think it would lead to a far livelier uh, dem democratic consciousness in society as a whole. Of course, it would take two or three or maybe four generations for this to work really well, but I think it would be very much better. And also to take away the silly... <laughs> To, to take away the, the ridiculous idea that, uh, that um, senior members of uh, political parties that you know, get into office, they call it power, but it's office, um, um, that they are capable of running large corporations. It's a nonsense. But also, aside, aside from the dysfunctionality it gives rise to, it distorts politics. That if the objective is to get the big jobs, it's not to achieve certain policy goals that people have mandated people to, uh, uh, representatives to do. So I think we should have something like the Italian system, as I understand it, or the French system, whatever, that uh, members of parliament cannot be ministers at the same time. And I think that would change things uh, quite a bit. It would mean that democratic debate was far, far um, more real, far more substantive, 
and far more honest in our institutions than otherwise. But also the, chain, the term limits thing would involve so many more people in the political process that it would be enlivening and deepening of, uh, of our democracy. I think a lot of that could happen with the European Union as well, that if, um, though it's, it's very difficult for the reasons that I've mentioned. Final idea about hegemony. By hegemony, I mean the prevailing mindset, the prevailing common sense, the, um, the um, what's regarded as calm, reflective opinion. Um, look back a few millennia and think of how for the vast majority of people, many of them are much regarded still, who thought that slavery was okay. Almost certainly, Jesus thought slavery was okay. Certainly, his uh, spin doctor, Paul, thought slavery was okay. <laughs> um, and uh, many other people uh, throughout history, including the framers of the American Declaration of Independence, who, 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 co who coined the phrase, all men are create, cre created equal, uh, oddly enough, let, let out the women, left out women. Um, and th they, these were slave owners. This was, this was part of the mindset, this was part of the hegemony of those times. And hegemony really ruled the world. Not so much corporations or powers, though they contribute to the creation of hegemonies that's in their interest, but hegemony rules the world. Similarly with regard to women. Just think of how we, reg how we regarded women in our laws, in our customs, in our practices, and in our institutions. 40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, we women's play, and the Constitution reflected this and still reflects this, that the women's place was in the home. And it takes a long, long time for people to change their minds, for, for the mindsets to change. Indeed, just think of the attitudes we had uh, to um, gay sex or uh, the gay community of um, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And it's, it's wonderful. That's two years ago, um, almost to the day, uh, we passed a referendum that um, changed our attitudes for the first time, gave validation and affirmation to the gay community. But this takes a huge amount of time, a, hu a huge space, it, as it does it, the slavery particularly, uh, women particularly, of course, and with regard to um, people of different sexual orientations. And the primary purpose, I think, of, of campaigns or of people who are interested in changing society and making it more just is to change the hegemony, you counter hegemony, argue, argue, argue about the necessity for a m radically, e e uh, radically more equal society. Just think of the fact that we are an extremely rich country, as I think Aidan was saying. And every, uh, if you are, if you were to average the, uh, the, uh, the wealth that we have across all households, every household would have over 100,000 a year. There would be no need for social welfare, no need for uh, Leo Varadkar's social welfare fraud teams. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. <coughs> More than likely, most people would get up in the mornings. <coughs> and, uh, and uh, um, things would be so radically different, but also so radically more relaxed, so radically more respectful of each other, so radically, the, almost certainly a good deal less crime uh, and, uh, and less, less abuse uh, of uh, all sorts. So those are my three points. We've got to change. I, I think it's, uh, the likelihood of making any significant change to the EU um, is slight, um, but I think a Senate instead of the European Council would be better. I think that in Ireland, direct democracy, um, term limits for in Parliament, and, um, and no ministers being members of Parliament uh, would change things significantly. But that's all really cosmetics, for the primary thing is equality. And and the, that can be only achieved through counter-hegemony, through campaigning. Thank you.
A heartfelt thank you to all the panelists, to each and every one of you. Uh, the Democracy in Europe movement deeply regrets not being able to put its democratic credentials uh, on the stage. I've just been told that this is not Greece and that 10 o'clock is too late and we have to vacate the premises. Here in Greece, we just begin at around this time. Uh, but let me not finish on a note of difference, but on a note of um, uh, coalescence and um, sameness. I remember when I, um, as a young, very young man, um, too young, I think, I moved from Athens to England as a student and I became immediately enmeshed in uh, student politics. Uh, one of the first friends that I made was an Irishman. And one of the first organizations we entered, because actually it was a very interesting political organization, was the so-called Black Students Alliance. And I became the spokesperson of the Black Students Alliance on the basis that we Greeks and Irish are the blacks of Europe. And the European Union and the Eurozone, its infinite wisdom, later decided to confirm our views. <laughs> but this is not the note I want to, to leave you with. DiEM25 emerged from this common experience that we, the pigs of Europe, had from the Athens Spring, as we call it, of 2015, and the way it was crushed in exactly the same way that the Prague Spring was crushed by tanks. We were crushed by banks, uh, and, and we hope that in exactly the same way that the Prague Spring nevertheless left a legacy, which in the end brought down the tyrants of the Eastern Bloc, uh, we are going to bring down the tyranny of idiocy and this conspiracy of incompetence which is ruling over the European Union. As far as um, what uh, Vincent said, whether th there can be a European identity or not, let's agree to disagree on this. But let's first stabilize the economies of Europe so as to end the centrifugal forces that are tearing us apart. And then we can have this conversation with Vincent and others on whether we can have a European identity. In the meantime, DiEM25 is building one because we are the first transnational organization. We're not a confederacy. We don't have a dub, a, 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 um, an Irish branch and a Greek branch and a French branch with the Irish making decisions for Ireland. And we vote through our voting platform, our digital voting platform, on everything together. So the, our position on the Italian referendum, for instance, um, was taken by every DMR throughout Europe. We all voted. We listened to our Italian colleagues, of course, because they are on the ground, so they know more. But then after we had a discussion, which they led, we all voted. Irish DMRs voted on the Italian referendum. We are now voting on, in the process, as of tomorrow, on our position whom we are going to support in every constituency throughout the United Kingdom. And you have Poles and Latvians voting about this. We're building the European identity. It's going to be a long process. Uh, and we may very, very well fail, Vincent. You may be completely right. I'll finish off with this little, tiny little story. At the Volksbühne Theater where we inaugurated DiEM25, uh, those of us who were on center stage organizing it. We had worked for six months for that event. Nessa was there. Um, it was back-breaking work. And on the end of the night, we felt so elated. People like Stretchko and Lorenzo and uh, Judith and myself. And we, we went to the, to, to, the, to the bar, of course, afterwards, with hundreds of other people. And there was such joy that we had achieved it. It was this grumpy, old German activist, somebody I've, I've known for years. He looked really grumpy, grumpier than usual. So I said to him, what did you think of it? He said, ah, it's not going to work, it's going to fail. You have no chance. And my friend Srechko and colleague and comrade actually got agitated because, you know, it just was com completely outside the spirit of the moment. He said, so why are you here? And he said, because I want to be around the people that will have to pick the pieces up once the whole thing goes haywire. Well, either we'll succeed or we will fail, but it's fun trying and people like us have to stick together to pick up the pieces if it fails. Thank you.